Greetings again in Jesus' name. You know, what many have done and are still doing in and out of the system today is turning Christ into a minister of sin. In that, I mean they're teaching a gospel that's based on lawlessness, human inability, and then virtually lawlessness. Because they're saying people can come into the faith committing such sins as listed in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, the fornications, the drunkenness, the, the, the lust, the perversions, be saved in those sins, and then they gradually come out of those sins. In other words, God's going to grant them forgiveness, a blanket forgiveness of those sins when they receive Jesus or confess their sins, or however they might put it. And then wait for them to gradually come out, out of those sins, as he changes their desires. Well, that's making Christ a minister of sin. It's like he said in Galatians 5.17, he says, But if we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners. As everybody keeps saying, they're sinning every day in thought, word, and deed. They're filthy rags, and all the rest of it. If we're found sinners, then Christ... We making him a minister of sin? Well, God forbid. God forbid. See, because you have to come out of your sin. Time and again, the scripture talks about, in repentance, those type of sins listed in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. Those are the things we're talking about. Those cease in repentance. Before mercy can be granted, there has to be a cleansing taking place in the process of repentance. Surely that happens with the conviction of the Holy Spirit under the, that, that conviction that brought the godly sorrow for sin, that brought you to that level of repentance. But man's ability to turn from those sins is still involved in that process because we're workers together with God that we do not receive His grace in vain. What do we talk about? To receive it without effect, to no purpose. Well, see, grace is what the power of God is. The power of God to deny ungodliness, worldly lust, to live soberly, righteously, godly in this present age. That's what Titus 2.11 says. Faith being obedience, well, in that process, then, we have the obedient faith. You obeyed from your heart. The first act of faith is obedience from the heart. Coming to God in repentance, then the grace to empower you to live that godly life in Christ Jesus. So there's no excuse to keep committing these sins and just say, well, I can confess them and I'm okay, based on 1 John 1, 9. No, you're not okay. If you're committing those type of sins, you've never experienced the redemption in Christ. Ezekiel says in uh, Ezekiel 18.30, he says to the house of Israel, turn everyone, everyone, he's going to be judged according to your ways. So the Lord says to turn yourselves from all your transgressions through your iniquity will not be your ruin. That's what's going to happen to many of you. Because you look at grace as unmerited favor, a magic cover for sins, and, re and faith as some kind of receive Jesus or repeat after me routine. Your iniquity is going to be your ruin. See, God doesn't want you to stop those sins listed in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 of uh, fornications and covetousness and homosexuality and, and fornications and perversions to rob you of all your fun is because they're ruinous to your soul. If you want the abundant life in Christ, it's going to have to be a life free from the corrupting influence of sin. But see, that's the problem. Most people today have received Jesus under this philosophy that I can't stop sinning, I won't stop sinning in repentance, that's for sure. And it's God's job then to make me stop. Well, then it don't stop, then it's God's fault, as I've said a hundred times. But you don't see it that way. So they look at the Bible and they see as, as grace through faith, you're saved by grace through faith, not of works, least anyone should boast, as this unmerited favor, no strings attached, repeat after me. Sin is, is essentially pre-forgiven. You're, you're saved to sin less, but you desire to do good. That's what I keep hearing from these folks. So you're going to sin less and less, but your desires are always to do good, but you're going to mess up. And by mess up, they mean you're going to commit these sins that uh, say will not inherit the kingdom of God. See, it doesn't make any sense because there's no pre-forgiveness of sin. Mercy cannot be granted mercy for remission of past sins until there's been a cleansing and purification in the process of repentance. 
If I lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, then receive with meekness the implanted word that's able to save your soul. That's always the process in Scripture, over and over again. But see, that's not happening. So they look at the Christian life as then decreasing the habitual sins. You just confess them each time they occur. As long as you desire to sin less and less, you feel bad about your sins. Then God's going to honor your intention because he knows your heart. So we always hear, God knows my heart. Well, yeah, God does know your heart, like Jeremiah says. He knows the heart. He knows the mind. He's going to test each one and give to each one according to their ways and according to the fruit of their doings. That's what you don't realize. See, under this destructive gospel, you get saved in your sins, and then you gradually come out of your lust and your perversion, your uncleanness, and God sets back patiently waiting for you to utilize his power then to finally come clean. Because you say in Christ you can do all things. But yet it never seems to happen. Everybody falls short and messes up. Anybody who says they don't is a liar and there's no truth in them. Or self-righteous, as he keeps saying. So they look at it as nobody's perfect, everybody falls short, and if you could stop sinning, you wouldn't need Jesus. Well, you have Jesus, supposedly. You have him, why can't you stop? Well, you desire to stop. And that's the best man can be. Man's not capable of righteousness. Man is capable of righteousness. He's incapable of doing what is right. That's why his faith can be imputed as righteousness, because faith, obedience, purifies the heart by obedience to the truth. So you got it all backwards. So you're caught in this mess up, committing these kind of sins, thinking that by doing them less, you have pre-forgiveness and you're not going to be held accountable. But I keep asking you, when does these sins stop? When's the perversion and the uncleanness stop? Well, it stops in repentance. See, that's the reason we have professed Christians. They're the most untrustworthy and dangerous people on the face of the earth. In essence, they can do whatever they want, no matter what it is, molestation, perversions of all sorts that we see in the news all the time, things that I shudder to even mention, they can do whatever they please and then utter this little prayer, and then they're forgiven because they received Jesus. And the sinners out there, well, they didn't receive Jesus, so they're going to hell for committing the same exact sins the professed Christians are committing. That's the mess here. See, most of the abuse suffered by people as I see as a result of this, comes from these professed Christ-mocking Christians, so-called Christians, professing to have received His grace and forgiveness, but yet they still commit these awful sins and then harm others. Because most, most of these sins that He's talking about in these scriptures harm others, like adultery and fornication and perversions. They're not only harming you, they're harming others. So that's the reason most of the, the abuse suffered in this world is suffered by these kind of people that have carte blanche, so to speak, to commit these sins because, well, nobody's perfect and it's not a works and you can't judge. At least you be judged because everybody's just a vile sinner because all sin's the same. Temptation, sin, everything you do, sin. And see, everything's backwards and upside down. See, the injustice of this is beyond reason and the damage that it's done to our society is immeasurable. You know, God, they transform God into like this Bozo the Clown playing peekaboo with sinners and pretending he doesn't see their iniquity and their wickedness. He says in the scriptures that if you do these things, you won't inherit the kingdom. Let no one deceive you with empty words. But yet, they keep saying, well, everybody does these things occasionally. You mean you don't sin? You don't willfully sin. You haven't willfully sinned against God since you've been a Christian. See, because they can't comprehend that in Christ, in this crucifixion of the passions and desires of the flesh, being purged and cleansed, partaker of the divine nature, exceeding great and precious promises of God, that it is possible to walk upright and mor morally right before God through His power. But they say, well, they have all this power. They have the Spirit. They have the truth but they still fall into these sins. So that's the way they look at it. Everybody does these things. Occasionally, they're going to fall into these type of sins. And if they don't, they're liars. So we just confess and we move on. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. Forgive us our sins. Cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Well, why would John say that? And then onwards in chapter 3, that he who sin 